we're going to carry on with the rest of the business. Um, the item nine now in our papers today is community power, place and partnership. Pages 125 to 145, and Suzanne's going to speak on this one. Suzanne. Thanks, Provost and members. I'm absolutely delighted to be bringing this paper to you today, which is really about how we shape and best serve our communities now and into the future, ensuring communities are involved in the decision making on services in their place. Just want to take you through, before I take you through the paper, I want to say it's important to say that, as you know, this has been developed and shaped over a number of months via a reference group involving the majority of heads of service or their representative, but also via a writers group, which I've been chairing, taking on board their ideas and observations, and of course, the feedback from yourselves via the recent elected member seminar. Therefore, it's really about a real commitment to multidisciplinary working in a partnership approach, and this will evolve over a period of time. It's also important to say that this report is very timely, given some of our local and national developments, particularly the Council strategic plan, and also from what communities have been telling us on the back of um, the recent COVID recovery and renewal work, but also um, with the current review of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act. The purpose of the report is set out in paragraph one is to really to ask you to reaffirm the Council's commitment to taking that collaborative place-based approach to the provision of services, our working and planning with partners and communities to harness community power and improve the lives of people, support inclusive and sustainable economic growth whilst reducing inequalities. Members, you're asked to approve arrangements for engaging with communities, ensuring that proposed place partnerships are co-produced, co-designed and co-led with our communities, stakeholders and our residents. This will be the first report in a suite of reports on this topic that will evolve and develop through the engagement set out later on in the report. The background at paragraphs three to six takes you through a bit of a history lesson um, on the journey where we've been as a council and where we currently are as a council right now and also through our community planning partnership. And this is important, particularly for our newer elected members in setting the context for this paper. Our community power journey set out in paragraphs 7 to 32 sets out the transformational journey we've been on as a council in partnership since 2011 up until now. And it's further detailed in the suite of good practice examples included in the appendices that have been uploaded to the members portal and are also available on the internet with today's papers. But thinking about the future and what that new landscape could look like is set out in paragraphs 33 through to 68. The focus is on building what's already been achieved and what's already strong here in East Ayrshire, how we ensure local community voices are involved in identifying local needs and involved in the decision making around their places. The fundamental prin principle of community power is to place the design and delivery of public services in the hands of the communities that they are there to serve and equalising that relationship. To align how we respond and embed community power further, we need to take cognizance of the place principle which was adopted by Scottish Government in COSLA back in March 2019 and subsequently East Ayrshire and um, this council adopted a place principle in, by Cabinet in 2019. This sets out the need to work collaboratively across sectors with everything at our disposal towards the most relevant outcomes for a place to address inequalities, improve lives and create more successful places. The National Planning Framework 4 brings in the concept of the 20-minute neighbourhoods. The proposed Local Development Plan 2 introduces the concept of 20-minute neighbourhoods into a policy context for East Ayrshire. People want to have access to services locally and be involved in the local decision-making on activity and services that impact on their local area, lives, work and leisure time. So thinking about how we embed the place principles and concepts of 20-minute neighbourhoods. It's proposed that we work with our communities and wider stakeholders to strengthen the community voice in our strategic decision-making through enhanced place-based locality planning arrangements. Sorry, excuse me. The enhanced uh, locality planning arrangements, which need to be co-designed co-produced and co-led with our buyer communities. The introduction of the proposed place partnership set out paragraphs 55 through to 65 would help us fulfil our duties fully in regard to the statutory duty 
in the Community Empowerment Scotland Act, building on the already strong foundation here in East Ayrshire. The paper sets out some guiding principles at paragraph 62. These are not prescriptive or exhaustive, but will be further developed and shaped through the extensive engagement set out later in the paper. At paragraph 63, apologies, the wrong diagram was included in your original papers, and I believe Julie McGarry's kindly shared with members yesterday the correct table that denotes the relationship of the proposed place partnerships with current locality and place-based arrangements. This is about moving away from silo working and about those working in a place, coming together with people and communities at the heart, building on our conversations we've been having locally and most recently around multidisciplinary team working, our heart model around our community wellbeing and also about place-based working. Paragraph 66 sets out a summary of what we heard at your recent elected member seminar of what you described as your role in this work. And it's important to note that there'll be further opportunity to contribute and develop this further through the forthcoming engagement sessions. The role of cabinet member with responsibility for localities has not previously been determined and it's proposed that the member, Councillor Filson, assumes the responsibilities set out at paragraph 68. In terms of how resources allocated in regard to staff, facilities and budget allocation, this will be further developed in the engagement process and brought back in the next iteration of the report, taking particular cognizance of the 1% participatory budgeting framework agreement set out by Scottish Government. The engagement is set out at paragraph 71 to 79. As stated earlier, the fundamental principle of community power is to place the design and delivery of public services in the hands of the communities they serve. Therefore, planned engagement that's undertaken would have that commitment at the heart of any activity or interaction and would follow our engagement frameworks. It would be with our communities, partners, elected members and our workforce and would follow that consistent approach as detailed in the table within your papers. Further recommendations emerging from the planned engagement programme will be presented back to Council, to our Health and Social Care Strategic Planning Group and also to the CPP Board back in, uh, in, into spring 2023 with a view to implement from summer 2023. This has given us time to really listen and shape how we move forward as a Council. So in conclusion, the proposal set out within the report seek to build on and strengthen the Council's current locality planning arrangements in order to ensure that as many voices across our communities are heard in relation to decision making and that our communities have opportunities to inform and influence service planning for their own places and communities. And the recommendations that you're asked to, to make are set out at paragraph two. So thanks, Provost and members, and I'm happy to take any questions and comments. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Appreciate that. A good report. Members, we'll open it out for discussion questions. Leader. Thanks, Provost. Uh, maybe first of all, just uh, pay a bit of thanks to Councillor Filson for uh, some of the work he's done in terms of localities so far. Uh, but maybe I uh, ask Suzanne just in terms of, just a wee bit, I'm not sure what we're intending in terms of Kilmarnock, in terms of one. Uh, you've already, we've already got Command at North. I'm, I'm not against these recommendations, far from it. I think they're probably the best fit. But you know, up to now, we've had a, a place making group up in Command at North West, which covers both my ward and Ward 2. You know, and uh, you know, already down down the road, they're doing quite a bit of extensive work there. How that's going to be effective, you know, when they're changing, they're going to be moving into the kind of the South Partnership because there are many things, you know, because it's. Well, three splits long part right down the middle, you know, for, for one. So obviously you want to, you know, we don't want to be splitting communities like that down the middle, you want to have projects that can affect both of them. So obviously there'll, there'll, there'll be a bit of, you know, overlapping here, but just want, want to know how we'll work, work that out. And secondly, in terms of Kilmarnock itself, even within this, we're, we're splitting the town centre down King Street, uh, the way the wards go, uh, just and how do we make sure that that fits in with uh, any plans that, you know, are, groups and come out to the centre or operate. Thanks. 
Thanks, through you, Provis. Yes, thanks for those comments. Um, that will emerge as the engagement process takes place and we hear back from communities themselves um, and from yourselves as elected members further about how we develop the place partnerships and what's the best fit for the communities and those groups and organisations involved. The table, certainly in your original papers, is the, the incorrect table. You've been issued with an updated version, should, which should hope um, have a better fit in terms of the wards without splitting their uh, communities too much. But just, you know, like so, I, but the new bit, we're still splitting long part down the middle. So, you know, how do we reconcile that? Just specifically, we have got an existing placemaking group that's already active there. Yep. Right, uh, Councillor Stewart. Just as an, um, are, are local people going to be on board with us? And um, look, we're covering Balloch Mile and the Dune Valley. How are we going to attract the folk in? Is it going to be people for community councils, development trusts, or are you just going to put the shout out for folk to, to come along? Thanks, through you, Provis. Yeah, um, take on board your comments. It's absolutely about anybody in your local community can have a voice and be involved in the, the local place partnership. It doesn't have to be your usual suspects or in the existing groups and organisations. It can be anybody with an interest in their local place that can be involved in that. And they will be developed um, and involved in that engagement process right across during um, the next few months and to get people's feedback about how they, they develop. They're just going back in. So how many people are we looking at on a, local, a locality group? How many for like our area would be sitting on that group? Again, that will be determined as part of the engagement. We've not been prescriptive in the paper. It's only guiding principles at this stage so that it is giving the communities a voice in how they want these to be developed and emerged. We have looked at practice both um, locally and nationally where similar models exist, but we want to make it right for the communities in, here in East Ayrshire so that will be developed by themselves. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, members, any further comments, questions? True. Uh, thanks, uh, Provost. As, as the spokesperson for localities, I thank Suzanne for the support and I support the paper. Still early days for, days for uh, place in localities, but I'm really encouraged with uh, the response of five five councillors who have been in the visits to their wards. A lot of good work going on out there, and I've got a, a good uh, empowerment ready happening with community asset transfers, the PB events, and even down in the south, where likes of the nine CC, we've even got community councils working together. With the uh, and down actually pat testing the partners <laughs> Christmas lights. That's the first time that's ever happened. So I think that's all coming for the nine CEC where the, the nine community councils are all working together down there. And they're actually in our four communities want to come on board with the nine CC. So that just shows you how everybody have talked together and communication, how things can happen for the better. So and the councillors here will have a lot to, to, to do with this again and, and I hope uh, They'll be the kind of conduit between the community and to make sure that the that the community empowerment is successful going forward. And the attempt to drive it forward is just not going to be a talking show. But we've got to see the big improvements in your, your local communities with the community deciding that itself. Well, thanks, Councillor Cowan. Thank you, Provost. I just want to build on the earlier comments by the leader regarding the, the North West current plans. Um, and also, I don't want to get into the detail of Ward 2 specifics. Um, so just some comments that perhaps I could take offline with Suzanne. Um, there currently is a community action plan for the North West area, which is due to expire next year. So I'd be interested to know what's the mechanism for that, because as the leader pointed out, that includes sections of Ward 2 and Ward 3. So how are we going to un unpick those two bits, which could be a simple task, I imagine. Um, but I'm also aware that there's a draft um, Ward 2 Commandment North, again, with parts of um, Ward 3 placemaking plan, um, almost ready to go. So are, are we looking at reinvigorating that process as well, based on these new place partnerships? Suzanne? 
Thanks, Provost. Jack, I can happily pick up offline with um, you, Councillor Cowan, about the specifics to do with that ward. However, it would be important to say that all the existing arrangements and plans would feed into the wider overall partnership and there would be representation on that. It's not there to replace or duplicate, it's there to um, complement what's already there in existence. That would be the plan, but it, obviously there's a lot of the detail to be worked out through the engagement, but happy to pick up specifics on your ward at a later date. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, members, any further? Uh, me and Drew had a wonderful afternoon down Ward 5. A caffeine do meeting everybody. And, um, uh, so thanks for all the work that's going on there uh, for placemaking and making our communities better. Members, the appendices of the report are available on the uh, members' portal and the recommendations are there. Do we accept the recommendations? Thank you very much. Thanks, Suzanne. Item 10, folks, Local Development Plan 2. This is the responses to the proposed plan, consultation procedures for moving to examination. An important paper, and Karen's going to introduce this one. Thank you, Provost. Um, members, I'm really delighted to bring you this paper today that represents the culmination of around four years' work on Local Development Plan 2, which is seen as before you at various stages seeking approval to progress. Um, we've had an opportunity to discuss this in detail over the last week with you all, as well as over the past couple of years. And some of you have sat in the Members Officers Working Group, which has met over 30 times during the plan making process. We've worked on this plan with other council departments and with key agencies, including the NHS and SEPA, and it has very much been a collaborative effort to get us to this stage. You'll have heard about the importance of the plan in various other reports presented to you today on both um, Marnock Development Framework Vision and the Localities paper, which just shows the importance of this work across all of our services. We've done um, more public consultation on this plan in really difficult circumstances due to COVID than we have ever done. And we have taken a lot of views into account in the early stages of the plan making process. Members, no local development plan will ever please everyone, but we do believe we have a plan here which will meet our strategic objectives and be really positive for the area and the people that we serve. Today, we are asking you to re-endorse the plan as approved by Council in March this year, which we are not proposing to change from what was approved and to permit us to submit it to examination following the public consultation that's been undertaken. This plan does a lot that previous local development plans haven't, and Alison will talk to you about infrastructure first. And I'm also delighted to say that the plan contains the first local development plan policy in Scotland on community wealth building, providing linkages to our regional economic joint working. The plan supports a visitor economy, projects like the Coalfield Communities Landscape Partnership, the Biosphere and the Ayrshire Growth Deal projects, which includes projects within Kilmarnock and Cumnock. Our work on regeneration with the key agencies group has been key and members who were at Cabinet last week will note the more favourable national policy position now in relation to flooding. If an LDP sets out that regeneration is needed, which means development of South Central Kilmarnock, which the plan does support, will now prove acceptable to SEPA, subject to the detail being right. And we will continue that joint working with SEPA and Nature Scott to realise the regeneration of that area that the LDP envisages. Members, I now pass to Alison to take you through a short presentation on the plan. Thank you, Karen. Um, just bear with me as I try and work out my clicker here. Um, I won't take up too much of your time at all. I know how long we've been here already. I've just got a few slides to talk you through a bit of the feedback on the LDP2 consultation, some of the key issues arising from it, and to talk you through the next steps for the plan. Um, so as members will recall, and as Karen reminded us, the proposed plan was approved by Council back in March. Following this, we had an eight week consultation period over May to July. The consultation met all our statutory requirements in terms of advertising, making the plan as available as possible and giving people a range of ways to respond. We did some face to face consultation, perhaps not as much as we would have liked as it was at the point in time when the final COVID restrictions had just been lifted. Um, but we did do some face-to-face -face work in Kilmarnock, Cumnock and Dalmellington and one-to-one -one sessions in Stewarton. We also made effort to meet with some of our community groups. We offered all community councils the opportunity for someone in our team to come and speak to them. 
And we also met with some other stakeholders such as Scottish Wildlife Trust and Kilmarnock Business Association. I think it's fair to say in terms of consultation that there are things that we will learn on in terms of LDP3. We'll look at what worked, what maybe didn't work so well and what we can learn from that. And certainly our LDP member of their working group is really keen to work with us on that next time round. So in terms of the consultation and what we got from it, we received around 315 representations from a whole variety of different stakeholders. So a lot of those are members of the public, but also a lot of house builders, renewable operators, and um, statutory agencies. So a whole, a whole variety of, of people. There's around 200 objections to volume one, which is the policies of the plan, and around 350 objections to volume two, which sets out the site allocations and settlement boundaries. So moving now to some of the key issues which arose from the consultation. Now, some of these are described in paragraphs 15 to 26 of the paper. The first one just to touch on briefly is housing allocations. And I think it's fair to say that in terms of LDP consultations, it is generally always housing allocations that generate the most response and the highest number of objections. In LDP2, we allocate around 70 housing sites, and there's a full range of sizes, locations, characteristics of these. So around 80% of the objections that we received to the plan sites were to housing sites rather than, for example, our business and industry sites or our miscellaneous sites or green space. Although it's also good to point out that over half of our sites received no objections. So around 60% were not objected to at all. So just to give you a wee bit of flavour as to where these representations came from, um, the largest responses you can see clearly were Fennec and Lee Fennec and Kilmarnock. Um, thereafter, Stewarton, we got a lot of reps, and there after that, maybe Mochlin, Drongan, and Darbo. Um, very broadly, and without going into the detail of these, in terms of the site allocations, our response to the objections is generally to emphasise two key things. Um, we need to provide enough land to meet our Scottish Government housing targets. That's a key role of the development plan, and this plan does that. Secondly, all our allocated sites have been through a robust assessment process. They've been through strategic and environmental assessment. They've been considered by the member officer working group, and we've already been to council back in March. So we consider the sites to be robust and defensible going forward. So another key issue that has emerged from the consultation is the importance of two new policy approaches in the plan. The first of these is INF1 policy on infrastructure first which states very clearly the need for all development to have an evidence-based understanding of potential impacts on infrastructure. And when there's an infrastructure need, it should be demonstrated by developers how this will be delivered. LDP2 also introduces a new approach to developer contributions. It gives scope to seek contributions for a far wider range of infrastructure, such as education, healthcare, transport, public realm, where there is a proven need. And it moves away from the current approach of kind of standard requirements to something that is far more tailored towards the specific needs within settlements. Now, there are, have been some objections to these policies, but we think that this approach is really important, particularly towards addressing some of the concerns our communities have in terms of the new housing and their impacts on services and infrastructure. So just moving on, another of the issues that have emerged from the consultation is development in Stewarton. We received approximately 60 representations, specifically in relation to Stewarton. Now, most of these, not all, but most were concerned about development of further housing and the impact of this on services. The plan allocates one new site in Stewarton, but also requires that this site provide land for a new school and community facilities. Our response to the objections is that we fully recognise the issues in Stewarton. Because of this, a lot of work has been done to seek ways to resolve the issues. Solutions to Stewarton aren't easy, we know that. And much of it is tied up with how densely developed the town is, with limited space to provide new infrastructure. So our approach has been to, through the Scottish Government's key agencies group, work really closely with all the bodies and service providers to better understand and plan around the issues in the town. And this has led to the draft development framework for Stewarton, which we also consulted on and which will become supplementary guidance. The new housing site must be accompanied by the provision of land for a new school. This is clear in the site requirements. 
So our view is that it was the work that's gone into this plan and the relationships forged through the key agencies group. We're in a far better place now to plan positively for, for Stewarton than we have been with previous development plans. Moving on, one of the other issues emerging from the consultation is the support for the Ayrshire Growth Deal. This is the first time the Growth Deal has been embedded within the plan. The plan allocates the four locations and supports their development, so looking at Core, Amec, Moorfield and Halo. And it also includes a new policy up front in the spatial strategy, which supports not just the delivery of the Ayrshire Growth Deal projects, but further projects that would support and be complementary to the Growth Deal. And as Karen mentioned, for the first time, we have a community wealth building policy within the plan. And I think quite reassuringly, we've received very limited objections to any of these elements of the plan. So turning now to the next steps and what we are seeking authority for today, um, we are seeking authority to now proceed to examination. Examination is a statutory part of the plan process. It involves all the objections being passed to a department of the Scottish Government who appoint a reporter to examine the plan in respect of unresolved objections. Parts of the plan which have not been objected to will not be subject to examination. And also important to point out, and this is made clear in paragraph 13 of the paper, that if Council agreed to move to examination, we cannot at this stage make notifiable changes to the plan. So that would be adding in sites, taking out sites or making changes to policy. Um, we expect examination will last around six to nine months and the recommendations that come out of it are largely binding on the Council. So just finally, the, what else we are seeking authority for is the approval of the Schedule 4 forms, um, which have all been placed on the Members portal. These are a key requirement of the examination as local authorities are required to group all the objections into issues. So we have identified 45 issues. Some of them are unavoidably very lengthy just due to the complexities of the objections, but some not so much. But the forms are a really important opportunity for us as a council to put across our arguments as to why the plan shouldn't be changed in line with the objections. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say on this. So I'll redirect you back to the recommendations on pages 200 and 201. There's a few of them, so I won't read through them all. Um, but essentially, we are looking at approval for moving to examination. And I'll hand back to you, Provost, and myself and Karen and others are happy to take any questions. Thanks, Karen. Alison, uh, a lot of work went into that. Right? Uh, a lot of officer time, members' time, uh, four years in the making. Um, thank you very much for all the information and the meetings we've had. Got a lot of questions asked and answered. Members, open it out for discussion and questions. Leader. Thanks. Just uh, echo your comments here, Provost. I think there's a lot of work going into this, and it's uh, a really good, uh, good document that's emerging here. Just trying to ask a, a, a local question for me in terms of some of the questions I'm getting asked, particularly around about the Crisouse area. You know, the Crisouse still refers itself to as a village, uh, and you know, it's, there's you know a bit of anxiety about maintaining its its uh, you know rural character as we see developments come in from the Kilmarnock side and, and Springside and even within the village itself. Maybe you know, might get his way to the 1967 wish of Kilmarnock joining Irvine of Eye Charity. So, I mean, hopefully we can you know, maintain some of that rurality. The sites at Moorfield, et cetera, are really important to important to us. Is there anything we can do to maintain green corridors there? Maybe looking at the density of some of the, the residential development we're, we're planning for there. And I know, you, you know, when you go down to Irvine, there's been quite extensive uh, increase in size of Irvine, but they've managed to maintain, you know, we just with lower density and maintaining hedgerows and stuff like that, that the rural character, there's not been as much of an impact as there has been perhaps elsewhere. And there's kind of maybe lessons lessons to be learned, not the many lessons that we've got to learn from North Ayrshire, right enough. But uh, there's maybe ways to protect uh, the rural character and villages such as Cousseau. That's what I'm after, Paul. No, thank you. David, come. Uh, Thanks, Provost. Through you, um, yeah, the the plan contains kind of another a number of policies in Volume One, which which will achieve a lot of those things. So there are policies on rural housing development, which will mean that coalescence of neighbouring communities wouldn't be supported. There's policies on protecting landscape, including things like hedgerows, 
And there's also policies um, which relate more to the detailed design of sites in terms of how a site might be developed out and the density and what might be appropriate and also in terms of the open space requirements that will be there. I think David's going to talk to you a wee bit around the specifics of Cross House. I am, yes. Uh, no, I think I think uh, Council did raises the issue. Obviously, the LDP originally had looked at, uh, you know, land for Moorfield, and that Moorfield actually moved out towards the uh, Chris House, and and obviously part of any you know final design that we come up with for any planning application that comes before, uh, you know, the planning authority will will take those matters into consideration so that we do have that buffer between the two areas. Uh, and I think it, there is obviously, as, as we've looked at specific areas, and Moorfield being a typical example of where we need to have industrial land uh, and that extension, it does go into an area which does move closer to to, uh, to Chris House, but as I say, we are taking those matters into consideration uh, in the kind of detail of the, for the, uh, the, the actual uh, planning application once it's submitted. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Prof. Thanks, David. Uh, that, that's really helpful. I forgot these meetings are recorded. Apologies to colleagues in the North there. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, uh, Councillor Mulvey. Thank you, Councillor Mulvey. Again, I'd like to echo the provost's words and say thank you for all the work you've done. And it was a very interesting experience being involved in the members working groups. And, you know, it's a very good plan at the end of the day and hopefully it all comes about. I suppose I got to say that I have to hope that we can trust to the officers and my fellow councillors that we definitely deliver the infrastructure first programme because we owe that to the people of Stuart. And so, I mean, I don't want to put too much on you, but I mean, I'm trusting you all that that definitely takes place. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Councillor Boyd. Thanks for the paper. <coughs> Some really good points in it. Um, just what um, Councillor Reid said about the house building, we do seem to be quite skewed to the north and west of Kilmarnock. We've got an ideal brown site. If SEPA kind of slacking off a bit, they'll form a safe way site. Historically, a Kennedy Street, that was tenement housing there. We don't need two retail parts in Kilmarnock. There's a lot of vacant land there. To me, that would be ideal for housing, a mixture of social and private housing. And then that means we could save some of the greenfield sites. I think we really should look at redesignating that area. Once we get approval, if we get approval for SEPA for that whole area um, around um, the former Safeway site right down to Tannock Street. I won't disagree with you, Graham. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Provis. Um, so th thanks very much for the briefing sessions that um, was held on Monday with members in Ward 7. I thought it was um, really helpful to talk through some of the the uh, plans and developments planned for Ward 7. Um, I did raise this in the meeting um, and, and previously before. Now, I understand it's a statutory obligation to consult with Scottish Water in terms of any proposed de um, developments. Uh, so as an example, I'm thinking of uh, an area in Ward 7 particularly that's in the plan for a possible housing development. Now, this is an area where there are long-standing water pressure problems. Now, water pressure problems to the significant significance of residents locally telling us they can't even wash their dishes some days. Now, I've raised this directly, as have residents, and Scottish Water's come back and says everything's OK. Now, I don't doubt that, that this is the only area experiencing issues like this. I'm wondering, what is the consultation with Scottish Water? What does it look like? And how would we address things like this collectively? Um, because it is clearly an issue, and residents have since voiced further concerns about the development and the further pressure that may arise uh, with, with their own water pressure. And just, just additionally to this, um, there's also many concerns in relation to capacity issues in Mocklin um, in, in Ward 7, as I know there is uh, across the authority, but particularly Mocklin with, with my point here. So I just want to say that moving forward, I'm really looking forward to see how developer contributions are going to be used to address infrastructure problems that may further arise in Mocklin. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, uh, through you, Provost. Yep, there's an um, Ayrshire Roads Alliance liaison group which we can use um, as a vehicle to help us um, kind of further cement our relationship with Scottish Water. This is not obviously a new issue to us, it's one that's been raised kind of um, by previous elected members as well as uh, current ones. Um, and we have got quite a good working relationship with Scottish Water now. So um, we're kind of confident that um, we can take that forward through this group. Thanks. The other part of your question uh, to be provost was to do with the sewerage infrastructure, and obviously, we, the Scottish Water are part of the the partnership arrangement for all the statutory bodies, so they're going to have to come up with a plan to to look at this uh, LDP two and to make sure that if they, uh, you know, what their long term plans are for developing their apparatus to to accommodate it, uh, I would say that the. Uh, as important that you know developers could come in with a planning application uh, to to be considered, but what will happen is that Scottish Water haven't got the the, the you know confidence that they can deliver that uh, sewage system, then they would be putting in an objection to that. But I do I'm fully aware of the, the ones you raised, particularly as well through uh, Councillor Roberts when he was here. So I'm fully aware of that. Thanks. No, thanks for that. I think that affects us all. Uh, good to hear that we've got good worker relations up with Scottish Water. Hey, hey. Um, <laughs> Council John McGee. Hi. <clears throat> thanks, Provost. Uh, delighted to see it. there's a, still a presumption against uh, coalescence. When I look at Comores, I thought there was a natural boundary there, the wee back road to Stewart and Nong Tiba, but I see part of the plan is we're coming across that road. And uh, when you look again, the South Craig's over the wee bumpy road, uh, Comores will shouldn't be part of Comarna, uh, and that's no exaggeration. Uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record again regarding uh, Stewarton and infrastructure first. i uh, delighted to hear that we're saying that we're better prepared than Stewarton than in previous plans, because there's been various councillors uh, in years going back saying that we haven't got the infrastructure right in Stuarton and uh, whenever you talk to folk in Stuarton they don't want only mere houses some folk and some folk are quite happy to have houses as long as we get the infrastructure first so I note that about 40% of the objections are for the Annick Ward uh, and again that there's no guarantees uh, but it could it be the case that houses are built and no school or infrastructure appear? The reason I'm asking that question, you said there were objections to infrastructure first. Who are making the objections? And we move to when we move to examination, is it possible that infrastructure first could be overturned or watered down? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, through you, Provost. Uh, no, well, national planning um Framework for the revised draft, which we're expecting to be approved over the next couple of weeks, also contains infrastructure first very, very heavily, and it will become part of the development plan once it's approved. So, um, even our plan aligns with national policy, therefore, it would be very unlikely for a reporter to take it out of our plan. But even if that was to be the case, it would still sit in national policy. So, it wouldn't. We wouldn't arrive at a position where infrastructure first was anything but the way forward. Pleased to hear that as well, uh, Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Provost. Just, just in terms of consultation and um, how fluid and important the LDP plan has to be, is um, uh, we had our own consultation on Monday, and I still had plenty to say after two years of being on the Members' Office's working group, and it was how much had changed in our own ward. We have 450 new houses proposed, we have another 100 going in, so we are saying, where's our infrastructure? Is that going to be there? Are we going to need another link north? Because it seems to be what's missing is missing north link in Ward 5. Are we going to be putting 500 new cars through the town centre over to the Belfield interchange? So everything links up, absolutely everything from chemist shops to roundabouts, all links up to the LDP. Like my colleagues, we had a very good discussion on stringing and uh, uh, in Fennec and the same problems that uh, John talked about as well. And it's amazing how many are subjective. Some people are quite happy to see stringing going along because that's how Scottish towns develop. And others say, no, we want to stop it and keep our unique 
um, culture within our own towns. So anyway, that was what I planned to say, but that's what I just said. Um, what I <laughs> I did want to say is I'm delighted to see infrastructure first is there and the developers contributions is getting another good reboot and that we have built in community wealth building incredibly important. Um, now, I'd like to thank everybody that served on the committee, the officers and my colleagues. I think we gave everything a right good going over. Um, you saw the errors that we did in it. At the risk of repeating myself on what I said in March last year was, and what I said actually just last week was, you know, other, other people did Duolingo, but I feel myself and my colleagues, we, we did LDP too. It's been a huge, huge learning curve and it's been an absolute privilege to serve on this committee. And believe it or not, I'm looking forward to LDP3 because that's how quickly we move on. And uh, yeah, you can all remind me of that in three years time. <laughs> but I, it has been an absolutely mammoth task of consultation and engagement and ideas. So I, I would just like to thank everybody. It's been a privilege and I thoroughly recommend that we put forward the proposed LDP2 for examination. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Councillor Canning. Thanks, Provost. Um, just to echo John's and both John's um, comments about, about infrastructure and Stuart, I just wanted to make the point, I think, and also thank um, the, the David and Alison and, uh, and Karen for the, the Stuart Development Supplementary Guidelines, because, guidance, sorry, um, because I think that's a really good summary. It includes the Stuart and Shared Action Plan, which is a really good summary of all the infrastructure needs within Stuart and currently and also for any proposed uh, plan. Um, I think that shared action plan calls for a um, a town team with key agencies involved. And I think that would be really important in terms of making sure that the infrastructure does go in first in Stuart. Um, and it also it, it calls out how that um, shared action plan will actually get implemented, monitored, reviewed, reported. So if I could ask officers, you know, in January, just to, if we could get the ANIC members together um, and, and start to look at how we can actually set up that, that team town um, so that we can make sure those, that action plan actually gets implemented. Um, thanks a lot. Alison, are you okay with that? Sorry, sorry you. I've, I've, Councillor Canning and I have spoke about this, um, so and we've agreed to meet up in January, so we'll be taking that forward. Thanks. Right, thanks, guys. Folks, any further questions on this, Peep? I see. Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much. Thank you again, uh, Provost. And again, it is just to, to thank all colleagues uh, present uh, still and past for the huge amount of work uh, that has gone in. I have just very recently uh, joined the member officer working group and I know the hours already that I have spent uh, in, in relation to this. It has been a huge body of work and that's from officers and members. So I suppose, uh, Karen, you raised the issue in terms of MPF4, and here am I just asking almost the, the unthinkable question. Given that that's just about to be published, we've made some references to it. Is there any possibility that anybody would come back and say to us, actually, you've been too late to get this forward. Let's just not... Uh, consider LDP2 and actually go on to developing LDP3. Thanks. Um, through you, Provost, thanks. Um, the transitional arrangements were such that we had to, we had the deadline of June to produce a proposed plan. And if we met that deadline, we were allowed to proceed under the existing legislation. Um, I sit on a kind of a number of different groups, including um, as a junior vice chair on the Heads of Plan in Scotland Development Plan Subcommittee. And we quite often meet with the government to discuss matters. And we recently had a meeting about a national planning framework for the implementation and also the continuation of the 34 different planning authorities um, across Scotland in terms of where they're at with their development plans. And they're very keen that um, 
given you the length of time it's been to produce um, NPF4, the development plans that are in the system continue through the system and that we have a plan in place um, that replaces our plan, which is currently out of date. So that absolutely wouldn't be the case. They're very keen that we progress with this and the Department of Planning and Environmental Appeals have been eagerly um, badgering us to see when we're um, proceeding to examination. Thanks. Thanks very okay. much, Karen. That's great. And I'm, I'm glad all the work that's gone into this is, is going to actually get there and get to that stage. Thank you. And again, my thanks to all members. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Provost. Now, just to intimate to the members that the concerns about Stuart were raised at the very first meeting uh, about the infrastructure. So we went on for the beginning and it's right up to this now. But the concerns were raised at the very first meeting. Yep, well, a lot of concerns were raised as well, Billy, but you're right. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that the predication from planners is brownfield sites as opposed to greenfield sites. So as much as possible, I agree with Graham, as much as possible, use the brownfield sites when they become available to offer them out. Uh, the problem you've got is when private individuals uh, and hedge fund managers maybe want more for their land than some builders are prepared to pay. That's just where we are. Members, uh, there's recommendations there. Are, are we happy with those recommendations to carry on? Thank you very much. Uh, item 11, nearly there. And this is uh, changes for the Labour Group. Are we OK with that, everyone? Agreed. Right, we're going to the, the motion now, and this is a motion for Councillor McFadgen. Now, um, Julie will keep me right here. Uh, introduction from the motion and the seconder. Uh, the proposer for the motion has got 10 minutes to introduce. The seconder has got five minutes. Uh, it goes out for discussion, or if there's any amendments or discussion, and then at the end of that time, that will be determined by me. We'll come back and the proposer will have a summing up, a few minutes to sum up. Are we okay with that? Everybody understand? Okay, over to you, John. Thank you for that, Provost. I shall read the motion out for you now. We, the Conservative Group, formally request this Council agree to the creation of a working group to help facilitate and re the, the reopening of Mockland and Cumnock railway stations. The basis of this working group would involve members of this council, MPs, MSPs, as well as an open offer to other council members in our region. The Conservative group in this process of running in the process of running an open petition on this issue, which is currently just under a thousand signatures of our local constituents and rising. We are expanding the village of Mochlin and the town of Cumnock. However, we need to seriously be looking at the transport infrastructure in this area. This working group would look to reverse the cut, the beaching cuts of 1965, increase the use of rail, which in turn would reduce the volume of traffic on the A76. The working group, the working group is important to one, reduce tra car travel between on the A76 between Cumnock, Mochlin, Kilmarnock, Glasgow and beyond to increase, boost uh, tourism to East Ayrshire's area. Three, reduce accidents and traffic volume on the busy A76. Four, increase train travel, which is better for the environment working towards our net zero targets. Accordingly, we call on the Council to agree to set up the working group for the purpose of lobbying the Scottish Government Transport Scotland, Network Rail and any other relevant agencies or bodies for the reopening of both Cumnock and Mauchland railway stations. To agree the composition of the working group as proposed above, any other appointments to the membership that the Council may consider appropriate, to appoint members of the Council to the working group in accordance with the agreed composition, to remit the working group to appoint its own chair and further develop their terms of reference as appropriate, and to remit to the group to provide regular updates on their activities and progress through cabinet and council and such other at such other intervals as considered suitable. Um, on that basis, I'd also, before going any further, I'd like to 
thank Councillor Watts and Councillor Simmons for the huge amount of work they put into creating this motion and to thank all the people involved in the petition. Now pass over to Councillor Watts now. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mapajan. Um, I'd like to give a little more perspective to our group motion for the creation of a working group. Um, and I would like to give an update on the current position of the petition to reopen Cumnock and Mocklin train station, as mentioned in the motion. Currently, the petition is standing at 1,215 signatures online and is as well being uh, collected from a paper signature base as well. Across the constituents in Ward 8, Cumnock and New Cumnock, and Ward 7, Ballock Mile. To give a little history, Cumnock Railway Station was originally part of the Glasgow, Paisley, Kilmarnock, and Air Railway. The station was located just off the A70 at Bar Hill Road, near the listed Templand Luger Viaduct. The station opened on the 20th of May, 1850. Mocklin Railway Station was also part of the same line as Cumnock and opened on the 9th of August 1848. It was renamed Mocklin for Catherine in 1887 and then renamed back to Mocklin in 1903. Both stations closed to passengers on the 6th of December 1965 following the beaching cuts. As stated in our group's motion, by reopening these train stations, we will reduce car travel on the A76, which in turn will reduce accidents, potentially increase tourism to the area, and it will help and it will also help to improve the environment. Provost, I hope that the council will support the creation of the proposed working group, as it is vital. Uh, sorry, as it is vitally important for our communities to see commitment and support from us to help improve the rail transport infrastructure and the volume of trains within the Cumnock and Mocklin areas. This would be extremely beneficial to the residents of these towns. Thank you, Provost. Thank you very much. Um... That's a proposal for the motion, Councillor McFadgen, and seconded by Councillor Watts. Uh, I'm going to open it up now, members. Uh, I can see uh, Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Provost. And whilst I can understand the thinking behind this motion, um, I think it goes to a wider uh, chat around public transport in general, um, but also uh, in terms of other locations that certainly our previous local plans and LDP have also supported uh, stations at Alton Hill in Kilmarnock and at Hereford. Um, I think the important thing here is that I wouldn't want to be giving the public any um, false hope that this is something that can happen overnight. I know, for example, and Billy Crawford is, is looking to speak as well, but I know Billy uh, 20, 25 years ago in his involvement with Cumnock Community Council in those days um, had looked at Cumnock certainly uh, many years ago. So whilst I wouldn't seek to oppose the motion, I would look to amend it slightly in that um, I think we should be looking at adding in Alton Hill and Hurlford. I would also say that if we were having a sort of member officer working group, then that would be suitable. I don't think we should be opening it wider than that. I don't think there really is scope for us to do that. And I think if we were looking to do something, it would be something that included um, our own members and officers. But we do know in these times of austerity too, potentially coming down the tracks, is the pun, um, that funds are tight. We know that SPT, for example, um, haven't indicated any resource for this either at this stage. But yes, by all means, we can ask for it and campaign for it, but we need to be realistic in the likelihood of, of this taking place um, and certainly would seek to amend it in that basis. Thank you, Provost. No, thanks for that. We'll, we'll come back to the amendments uh, 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 if that's OK, Barry. Councillor Lennox. 
Hi, thanks, Provost. Um, I think we'd all give you wholeheartedly with any initiatives to improve rail links in Lachlan and Cumnock, and it would be a very positive thing for both communities and would be an additional welcome benefit to commuters in both towns uh, for all the reasons just given. However, I don't think we should be looking at reopening the rail walks in these locations in isolation. I think it's vitally important to see the bigger picture and to look at the transport infrastructure in its, in its entirety. I also think that each community needs to be looked at separately because I'm quite sure the needs of Mochlin will be different from the needs of Cumnock. There's a lot of support in Mochlin for a bypass, for example, a subject which has been talked about for decades in a, bit to, in a bid to address issues relating to speeding, safety, poor air quality and journey times. The responses that we got during a doorstep survey in Mochlin recently saw around 72% backing moves towards a bypass compared to only 28% for a rail hall. So yes, there's popular demand for a rail hall, but there's even more of a desire for a bypass. There are similar issues that I've just described in relation to Mochlin that are raised regularly by the residents and community groups of Mirkirk. We also have to contend with trunk road traffic and A70, so this too needs consideration. I'm just trying to paint a picture here, promised that there are numerous transport net network issues that exist, uh, certainly at least within Ward 7, that require our attention. Having said that, I'd also suggest that community support for a proposal isn't sufficient in itself. It needs to be backed up by evidence of the costs and benefits for the project, and importantly for each community separately. It's also vital that we look at the potential negative impact. A real halt or station being reopened in either Mochlin or Cumnock could potentially adversely impact our rural bus services, which are already suffering from cuts. The removal of the X76 direct link to Glasgow, where you now have to change at Kilmarnock, is one example, and the lack of service to the village of Sorn, leaving the village essentially cut off and isolated from public transport, is another example. These are the types of issues which may not be obvious, but must be understood, certainly within uh, Ward 7. To my mind, although very well intended, I think the motion falls short of addressing some of the major issues around transport network, particularly in Mochlin, despite these being clearly stated in the community-led action plans. So given that, I would therefore like to put forward an, an amendment to the motion as follows. The Council agrees to use the existing placemaking initiative arrangements so that local communities, along with elected representatives, can develop a comprehensive transport strategy covering, covering rail, road and public transport. We believe that local communities are best placed to determine their own priorities, which will support local economic regeneration with realistically achievable outcomes. We can attract investment from governments and bodies such as Transport Scotland if there's a sound economic case supported by the community, which supports other public investment, including the Ayrshire Air Growth Deal, and levelling up investment, including the Belfield Roundabout, which will connect directly with the A76 corridor. Provost, without pre-empting anything, I'd expect that under that effective level of scrutiny, an A76 trunk road bypass for Mochlin, as well as the A70 and A71 links to the M74, rural bus service provisions, and the Mochlin and Cumnock rail halts would all be high on the agenda, thereby satisfying a broader spectrum of objectives. I also think that the additional benefits of this amended approach will be that, firstly, it will be community driven and their own priorities will be more fairly addressed, thereby more in line with and at the same time underpinning the empowering communities principle we heard about earlier from Suzanne. Secondly, it will provide a more holistic approach to transport infrastructure requirements and needs within this part of the authority. Thirdly, the various relative dependencies as previously stated will be better understood and rationalised and lastly, but by no means least, it will minimise officers' time and involvement at this particular stage 
given the increasing numbers of working groups underway at the moment for antiprobes. Thanks, Councillor Lennox. Now, um, the, the reason why uh, Barry was new uh, that there might be other amendments, are there any other amendments to this uh, motion? Because I want to get that sorted out, because sometimes if there's two amendments, they're might very, very closely linked. So Obviously. you're still happy for yours. If you get a seconder, Barry, to go ahead. Obviously, I think ours could be well encapsulated within uh, Willie's, including Alton Hill and, and Hurlford, been mentioned, and that it would be something that was uh, encapsulated within Willie's amendment. I'm sure we, you know, we could go with that. Well, I understand. But I'll, I'll ask for a, a, a second, or if, if one's needed. Uh, leader, I was just going to add, you know, whatever amendment that we agree, I think we're kind of closely getting consensus here that, you know, we would. Irrespective of our right to, the, on behalf of the council, right to the transport minister to get them down here, uh, to you know, to see what the issues are. No, that's a good point, um, Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Provost. <clears throat> Just on uh, what Barry was saying earlier, there, some time ago in my past, I was involved with the campaign for a station in Cumnock. I've got to say that at that time. Come that was smaller, everybody was quite happy to go to Auchinleck because it's as near for this side of the town to Auchinleck station as it would be where the old station was. Now, that was the end of my question. Have we any idea where they're thinking locating it? That was number one. The other thing is, if it's as good and effective as the speed that we're going at with the municipal bus, eh, Motion that I put up, it must be about four years now, and we'll know a bit further for it, I'm sure. So I would go along with what they're saying is we need a better connection for public transport, buses in particular, and a better service for British Rail. But uh, I'm not against the motion, uh, but I, I think we need to get our things into consideration. Thank you. OK, uh, Councillor John McGee. Hi, thanks, Provis. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Crawford makes a, a, a really good point about the municipal transport. What's the point of this council passing a motion and then we don't progress it? As apparently, I'm not saying we haven't progressed it. Again, Kevin Braidwood has gave uh, updates periodically regarding where we're at, but it's went really never. And now that we've got young folk as well as older folk with free bus passes, again, some folk are complaining now about the young folk's free bus passes because they're using them to congregate and all the rest of it. But it was a really yeah. good idea with great intentions so as that young folk could get yeah. to a place of work or whatever. Now, they can't get to a place of work if there's no a bus. And stagecoach are forever eh, deleting a... Eh, routes and, and buses at short notice. So I think, and it's a, a point well made by Councillor uh, Crawford, I think the amendment by uh, Councillor Lennox, I think, uh, has got uh, good merit and it doesn't deflect for the motion uh, presented by Councillor McFadgen and what, and uh, adding uh, Hurlford uh, and that into it. I don't think we'd go amiss because it would allow us to do the, the broader strategy. Thank you. No, that's fair. Uh, we've got Councillor McMahon and then Councillor Boyd. Just to back up some of the points that the, the elected members, and then just for clarity, uh, I, I'm quite happy to let, I was going to second that amendment for Councillor Lennox, but I'm happy if any of the other members want to do Just a couple of questions on the motion itself. It's running about the members of the council. Would that just be elected members or would that be officers as well? Uh, other council members in the region, just a bit of clarity on what other council members would be, and particular run about the, the terminology region. And the open petition that you mentioned, I think it was 12.15, uh, I, I, I think that's online, uh, but I'm, I'm intrigued by the paper uh, petition as well. I have no, how many uh, signatures are on that? And if I could come back and just later on in that, probably just questions. No, that's okay. I think, are we ready for questions to John, 
about the uh, the motion. There were some questions there. Right, thanks, Neil. Um, I think um, coming back on the paper petition, uh, Councillor McManon, uh, the paper petition are spread across quite a few people that are collecting them door to door. I am led to believe, speaking to the person in Mockling yesterday, they have got between about 250 to 300 in paper version that need to be added on to the 1215. Just clarification on uh, members of the council, whether it's member officer working group for that he's talking about, or and the other council members, and uh, clarification on the region. Uh, yeah, it would uh, be um, a member officer working group, and um, that is correct. And the opening up of councillors to other regions uh, was suggested um, from uh, Kevin Braidwood in. Um, are, uh, with regard to the uh, other sections such as Dumfries and Galloway and South Ayrshire that would link into the Mocklin and Cumnock areas. Um, go, going back on something else uh, that uh, Councillor Lennox said, um, at, at this moment in time, uh, yes, people use Ockham Neck train station. There isn't really the parking facility, um, considering that Ockham Neck actually serves Mocklin, Muirkirk and Cumnock. So it's, it's serving three conurbations at the moment um, without really any parking infrastructure. And that really is the issue, because if you're in Muirkirk and you've got to get to Glasgow, you won't, and you, you, you're going to do it via train, you literally have nowhere to park when you get to Ockham Lake to actually, you know, be able to jump on the train. So um, I, I, I see the point uh, with the bypass um, that he also mentioned as well. And I, I think opening up the working group um, at looking at all areas of transportation um, is probably a good thing. But what I would say um, is that primarily looking at railway uh, infrastructure is because the railway infrastructure, the railway lines are already there. Um, it's a lot easier to put in, in theory, um, a couple of platforms with an overbridge um, in Cumnock. Um, next in Cumnock, it'd be next to where the site used to be. Um, and in Mocklin, it would be just outside the town. You wouldn't really need be able to put it where it originally was. Um, but yeah, I mean, so yes, that, Looking at all transport options is an option there. Um, but I do feel that, and I certainly adding uh, Hurlford and I can't remember where else Councillor Douglas mentioned, adding that into it would be fine as well. I mean, the wider scheme, certainly we need to look at the infrastructure. Um, at the moment, the A76 corridor is an absolute nightmare. Um, there are a lot of people in Cumnock that commute to Glasgow um, and yeah the A76 is just not up to scratch and this helps with um, helping the environment it gets people off and it reduces the car okay that was on I apologize hold on hold on we get leader then councillor Boyd I was just uh, a couple of, you know I would hope that the the, the John, you're able to, you know, cap, bring all these elements into the uh, into the recommendations, and that, I think that's something we can certainly uh, support. Uh, just in terms of the composition, I think you know, just we don't want to exclude any sort of, a, you know, if, if a broad, broad principle are the uh, local members plus the transport spokesperson would be accepted. Maybe that's uh, maybe the way to get down. Uh, just in terms of broad principles. And just maybe to add, I know exactly where it was coming from in terms of affordability. You know, bypass is a huge undertaking, whereas maybe a, a, a rail halt is maybe more achievable. But, but the immediate thing that I think, you know, in terms of public transport, we need some, you know, a coordinated push to get improved public transport uh, dealt with in, in, in the South Authority because that's been becoming an increasing problem. But if we can encapsulate all that, I'd be worthy of support. Well, thank you. Councillor Boyd. 
Thanks, Provis. I would also want um, Halford and Alton Hill included if this motion was going forward. Uh, Councillor Lennart's made a really good point oh. um, about access to the M74, you know, because you've got problems with Markland, Muir, Kirk, and also the Valley Towns. You get the traffic up to the M74 via via the A71 and the A70. You know, and I know it's probably not going to be possible, but see if you look at the map, there should ideally with the size of population here. So it's got a dual carriageway for Belfield to Lairs Mahego connecting with the M74. I know the money's going to the A9 and it's a bigger picture, but that would alleviate a lot of problems in the valley, um, Mochlin, Cumnock, and also Muir Carcarriers. That's just to highlight. I've spoke to Kevin uh, Kevin Braidwood about it, but I know with the uh, government policy, it's really a pipe dream, but it's just that would have solved a lot of problems. Ayrshire's a massive area, and we don't have a... We've got good road connections within it, but we don't have good connections to the M74, and that's a big problem. No, thanks. Uh, uh, we've been speaking about that for a long, long time, Graham. Um, Councilman McMahon. Uh, thanks again, Provost. And I, th I think more or less everything's been covered with what my expectations would be, but uh, I, I, I couldn't be amiss if we know to talk about beaching and run about the cuts they made there and the implications. It's now coming back to, to bite us. Five and a half thousand miles of track, 67,000 workers, 2,363 stations all closed. Beechin made the cuts on the advice for Ernest Marples. I think we'll all be familiar with Ernest Marples and his, his uh, association with road building projects and had led up to sell his shares in some of the road, build, the road building company I had to his wife, by the way. Uh, then he uh, uh, taken them back. So the statistics that come round about the footfall of the proposed train stations have come, and let me say that that's a, 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 a I would be for that, that train station, but 200,000 for Cumnock and 120,000 for Mochland plus seems a really inflated figure because it's coming for a campaign group that wants to take everything off the road and move it to, uh, to rail and air. They want to bring it up as well. So they, they figure seem inflated for me because a uh, .gov.uk site is telling me there's 77,000 people used off on light train stages and established train station. And 30, 13,000 journeys were season ticket holders during there. It's already been touched on that a large proportion of housing in Cumnock is closer to a light train station and for where the new proposed site would be in Cumnock. A wee bit of data run about what we've currently got with trains and availability. So we've only got eight diesel trains that run for Carlisle to Glasgow daily. There's no capacity at Glasgow, and we know that because they can't take any more trains in there. They can't accommodate a line for the airport. So we'd be struggling. Only addition to trains, if we could, they would, wouldn't they be committing to meet our net zero targets? It would only be increasing by adding diesel trains on that line. Electrification of the line, we know, is decades away. And even if we could electrify it, I think there'd be problems that we couldn't do it by the top side of Malton with the King and Cliff Tunnel. You can't raise the tunnel, and the, the, the issue for me would be dropping the rails there to electrify it, and we know that's one of the first places that floods on that line, and we'd be, we'd be creating a lock in there. There's currently 30 buses that, that run for Cumnock to Glasgow with a link for, for Kilmarnock. Unfortunately, the X76 service has been taken off. But we know there's plans underway for a, a bus lane the, on the 77, which would probably help a long way uh, encouraging footfall back onto transport. It's been touched on again. I think John touched around about the, the 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 travel currently for the buses is free, and there's no that same level of support for under 22 pensioners and folk with disabilities on train. I'd asked uh, a business development director of a major public transport company about the impact that might be on the bus yeah. service, the rural bus service, and uh, it, it stated clearly any train station potentially would have an impact. However, there's also we need to take into recognise the public transport alternatives and active travel options as beneficial in reducing uh, the use of private car and van. But we would also note that rail schemes are very expensive per passenger kilometre and targeting this spend in bus network and ticketing would provide a much higher return of investment and have a greater impact supporting the local economy. We've already seen the uh, introduction of electric buses locally and there's a full of planned expansion of that electric fleet and the roads complement never increasing amount of cars and vans that are doing likewise to drive downward CO2 emissions. 
friendly for me, as I said, I, I, I agree with the motion and the, the amendment uh, and the formation. But for me, the, the, the group should be, and I'll make reference to the paper that we've already had today, uh, and item eight is placed, and it all needs to be run about place, and each group should be placed, and that's like if, if this amendment goes through for Hurlford and the other stations as well. The focus has got to be on that place and the needs, uh, what the communities want, and as it says in the, the paper and uh, 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 own place, we facilitate the communities, it's what they want. Uh, so for me, I'm, I'm I'm happy with the the, the motion, but for me that ties and everything when we forget the bypass and push for that bypass, uh, primarily focused on the bypass, and also that links in with, with plans for the Belfield interchange to make that journey to Glasgow a wee bit freer and a wee bit smoother. Right, thanks, Jim. Now I've got a, a pile of folk uh, we'll get in. We'll get through them quickly, then we'll need to go to determination, folks, and join more of the opportunity to come back in. Um, Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Provost. I think so much has been covered. I'll just keep it quite brief. It's in terms of the paper petition and the online petition. Two questions, oh, three actually. Is the wording the same as the motion that is on the petition? Um, secondly, when is the petition due to close? And thirdly, when will it be published? Thank you. Do you want to answer that an hour? Do you want to wait to the summing up? Uh, uh, Councillor Maitland, the, uh, the petition is online and basically uh, is the, the points that uh, in the motion uh, where it says the working group is important too, that is, is included into it. Um, but it, it's calling on the, um, the petition that is online and in paper is open, it's an open petition. Um, it's being run by the community as well as ourselves. Um, it will close when it closes um, and be then presented. And what was your other question? I just want to come back on that, but petitions should have a shelf life so you can then measure how how good they actually are and what the response has been, and then you move on from the petition. So it was just from a a background in this, I was wondering when it was going to close, because it's instead of keeping it open and when the results would be published. Thank you. Well, the results will be published when we close it. And I would imagine from what you're saying, I understand what you're saying, it'll probably be early next year. It's longer than was normally and was what was intended because it was started just before Her Majesty's the Queen passed away. And obviously during that period, we didn't do anything. The campaign came to a stop and then it was restarted again once we got past that period so it it is why i say it's open is because we've had to extend from where we originally wanted that to be but i would say early next year no no that's absolutely fine thanks for that explanation neil Councillor crawford use your hand up was it a legacy thanks billy um deputy provost Thanks, Provis. I, I don't think there'd be anybody would disagree with it. It'd be amazing to have rail stations um, or, or halts opened in, in Mauchland and Cumnock. Uh, however, I suppose since we're talking about um, setting up a form of group, um, I think it would be, as we've discussed, negligent and I'm missy is not to consider additional transport infrastructure problems that um, do exist locally and have existed locally for quite a significant amount of time. So as a world member, a Ward 7 uh, member, including the need for and public desire for uh, a Mauchland bypass. Now, that's not just the residents of Mauchland, that's commuters coming from um, surrounding Mauchland as well, coming up, come on, like, you know, whatever. So I suppose speaking on behalf of the bypass angle of things, um, as Councillor Lennox would say, we were out doing a, a doorstep survey on Sunday and asking residents, um, you know, uh, what would your priority in terms of the infrastructure be? And it was overwhelmingly in favour of a bypass and that was identified really heavily and consistently through the day we were at Chatham Doors. Now, a lot of really significant issues uh, were, were raised for the need of a bypass. So residents say Jean Armour Drive and the Beechwood Road at Auchin Lake um, in an effort to avoid the bottleneck that exists when you're entering Mauchland um, coming back through for the Kilmarnock side, 
Um, cars are jumping in. Uh, the Beechwood Road going down Dunedin-Anmer Drive, effectively using it as residents um, describe as a rat run. Um, now, for people who don't know this area, it's a, it's a built-up area. There's loads of kids, um, elderly people, and it has a sheltered housing unit at the bottom as well. And then they're pulling out onto the main road um, to try and bypass that stuck traffic at the top end in Mocklin. Now, thinking as well about the hilltop path in Mocklin, there's an investment in to make this lovely walk safe. The hilltop path, it's, a, it's a up by the school, up to the top of the hill, the hilltop, smashing view. Um, but walkers now, where the hill path has went in, have says that they just don't feel comfortable walking it at peak times because of the, the speed and volume of traffic that's um, travelling doing that. Now, again, um, if we think about... Um, the route that it takes to get to the hilltop, it's a single track road. It, it exists before the entrance to the new houses in Mocklin. Um, how, um, um, like the road is the same name as a house and thing. Um, Hillhead Road at Hillhead Heights. Um, it's a single track road. There's cars going nose to nose a lot of the time up by that. Um, and it, it is significantly uh, dangerous. Now, again, when we were talking to people down the Comarnock Road. Um, if MD goes and looks at the 30 mile an hour flashing sign just down by the Burns Memorial Tower, there's a significant amount of cars trigger that sign um, trying to get them to, to slow down. And one resident told us it wasn't long ago that cars smashed in to park cars down that road. And it is a fear that exists. Now, for me, it was the one wee person lovely, lovely chat with this person who mentioned their fear about breathing the car emissions due to the level of station of vehicles that's constantly on that road, particularly half four to half six, that she says, um, and let alone we are kids growing up with that. So, Again, I agree it would be smashing to have, you know, a real halt stop, but I do think we need to take the opportunity to expand the purpose of any group that we make to explore and address other connectivity issues, uh, lobbying for a Mockland bypass and looking at rural bus service provisions, to, to, to name a couple. But as a Ward 7 member and a regular commuter on that road, that road is horrific. It's described as dangerous and um, it's no before time that a bypass could, could, get, done, could get done there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. We've got uh, Councillor Richardson. Thanks, Provis. Um, really interested in this chat so far. Um, I just want to bring sort of 20 years of experience of commuting to Glasgow on the railway line uh, during peak time in the morning and peak time at night just to council, because I think we're missing the, the elephant in the room, as it were. Listen, council, um, train stations at um, Cobbett, Mocklin, Alton Hill, Halford, great but it, that would only increase capacity now pre-covid when you go on that train at Kilmarnock it was busy it's a four carriage train see by the time you get to Stewart it's stuck this is pre-covid so the numbers are building back up again once you go to Stewart it was standing room only once you go to Barhead folk were being left on this platforms because there was no room on the four state carriage trains to get on now you, so basically, you've got then two options. If you increase capacity, go to six carriages. Then your problem is the stations on the line, the platforms aren't long enough, right? The other thing is, what's the other option? Try and run their trains. Well, thanks to Dr. Beecham, the line between Kilmarnock and Glasgow is single track. So I spent hours of my life, I've spent days of my life sitting with what they call the Lugton Loop. Because see if the train leaving Glasgow Central is five minutes late, it needs to go into the, basically there's a loop in the line because you need to let the one go north past so that you can come south. So basically what happens is you're five minutes late going down the line, the train's coming up, going to Glasgow, your train needs to go into the loop. You sit there for 20 minutes to 30 minutes. The elephant in the room, guys, is more stations would be great, but capacity getting in and out of Glasgow Central is your problem. And if you're going to, if you're going to make it two lines so that a train going north can pass a train going a train going south. Good luck with that because Beecham ripped up one of the lines and God knows how many multi-millions it would cost to make the line two track again. So there's it's not just putting in stations, it's about having the capacity to get the people own carriages in and out of Glasgow Central and up and down a single track line. No, fair points. I've got Councillor Mackay.
sorry about that. Sorry, thank you very much. My hand's been up and down so many times. I think mm -hmm. that there are excellent points made all of the way through and there are some of us uh, who are here who know the amount of work and I would want to pay tribute to Councillor John McGee in particular for the immense amount of work that he put in uh, in terms of truly understanding the absolute detail, just as Councillor Richardson makes some passing reference to in terms of what it took us to actually get that half hourly service uh, in terms of uh, doing that from Kilmarnock to Glasgow and all of the issues that were associated with that. That was years and years and years of real detailed graft to actually make that happen. And Councillor Richardson is, of course, completely correct. As others have also said, the issues are about what actually happens in relation to Glasgow, uh, because it's all very well as sort of it raising issues here. I also think, uh, again, Councillor Lennox is our uh, representative on Strathclyde passenger transport. Uh, there are processes and we absolutely have to be mindful of how those processes are. Again, I think it was Councillor Lennox, but forgive me if I've got that wrong, who uh, raised the issue that the uh, New proposals on spend have just been released, I think it was on Friday of this week. That then actually gives us a framework. We understand the lobbying that we have to do, the decades really that it takes us to get this work on the agenda. And I think where we are is what is actually being proposed here, and that is that we actually make sure that Ayrshire and Ayrshire's transport and infrastructure transport needs in relation to passenger transport are fully understood and absolutely have their rightful place on SPT agenda, and we actually work forward and move from there. And I think the number of... Uh, elected members who have had some input into this discussion shows us that what this motion has actually exposed is something that we absolutely do need to get to grips with and we really do need some of the advances that we have been lobbying for for years. Thank you very much. Thanks Maureen. Uh, Councillor John McGee. Hi, thanks Provost. And thanks to Councillor Mackay for mentioning the, the half hour service. And uh, I think that was something that was promised to us for about 25 years or more. And then when it was in about to come up about, we were told it couldn't be done. And they couldn't have trains into Glasgow. And they couldn't have trains stopping at Comores. They couldn't stop at Dunlop. We heard all that. And it was garbage then. And it's garbage now because the train stops at Dunlop and it stops at Comores every half an hour. We proved them wrong and there were a lot of folk in the railway helped us because they wanted that project because they'd worked 25 years to get it going. Now, what I would say about this uh, motion here is the one thing it's done is started a really good discussion because in lots of things, the Ayrshire Growth Deal, Economic Forums and that, that I've attended by uh, Councillor Reid, the leader of the council, we've always talked about transport and various routes, whether it's the 77, the 71 and all the rest of it. And I think uh, Councillor Lennox has made Ken his amendments and I think uh, his amendments were accepted. I think uh, to have that broader discussion, having uh, additional rail links, I looking at Cumnut and Mauchland, would that be possible? It would take decades. But see if we don't start now. When will we start? I think uh, we should be putting something together. And I think we should also get a full report as to where we are with the motion for the municipal transport. Can where did that go? Has it just disappeared and we've just no bothered with it? Because what's the point of having uh, motions if we don't follow them through? So, I mean, for myself, uh, I would be going with amendment by Councillor Lennox, which I think has already been accepted by Councillor McFadge and Councillor Watts, so, yeah. No, thanks. I'm going to ask Councillor Filson, and then we'll draw it a close, guys. We'll, we'll go to vote. If we need to, we'll go to the vote, but we'll tease that out. Drew? 
Thanks, Provis. I just agree with everything that's been said. Perfect project for community empowerment, uh, given the communities their say. And I'd just like to offer my assistance, Scanner, uh, going forward to help this. Okay, thank you. Right, thanks. Now, I'm going to ask if uh, Councillor McFadden needs uh, to sum up, uh, or based on the discussion, will it be an overreaching transport policy that uh, will, will, will affect everyone in East Ayrshire Council? Would that be better uh, going forward uh, with, if you've got the time, to have that member officer working group? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this, uh, Joy, this is your summing up. Yes, yeah. this is my summing up. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank everyone for their input. You know, even the negative things that have been put forward are actually important. So thank you for that, because everything needs to be taken into consideration. We've got to start somewhere. So why did we pick the railway stations? Because they seemed a little bit more feasible financially than trying to do everything at the one time and getting, you know, the, the, the bypasses, which would be absolutely fantastic. I realise, yes, you know, you go into Glasgow and there's, you know, congestion in the stations and stuff like that. But, I mean, the more cars you put down the A77, the further back beyond Newton Mearns, everyone stops. And that's huge amounts of emissions. Thousands of cars sitting going on, you know, all the time. Yes, diesel trains make some emissions. It's it's a give and take thing, if you know what I mean. Some things will be better than others. Not everyone... We're not expecting everyone that got on those trains is going to get go to Glasgow. We're hoping some people will come to Kilmarnock. We're building, you know, industrial sites and we're trying to create jobs here in Kilmarnock. You know, we've got put up buildings and all sorts of things. So we, we're hoping some of the people will just come as far as come that walk to Kilmarnock and get off and go back. Also, in the short term, I think the trains help the road situation. We're proposing these stations go where there's very feasible amount of parking. And if people can park there, then they're not going to need to drive the cars down those roads. So we can make take some pressure off the already pressurised roads. Yes, which still will obviously need repaired. So everything is positive and we've got to start somewhere. And we certainly definitely propose and we accept the amendments, but you know, it's an East Ayrshire based transport working group strategy that's what we're looking for you know to represent us in all capacities and possibly you know we'd like a an immediate focus on trying to get those stations in because we think they are deliverable and i think they they would certainly help and as they say anything negative about them would be offset by other positive things so i mean we're looking for a local transport infrastructure working group for East Ayrshire, and that's what this motion brings forward. This is something the discussion shows we desperately need. We need to represent ourselves nationally in Scotland. So, and I think yep. covers it. I mean, that covers it. I mean, if I'm willing to accept, you know, Council Lennox's and everyone's amendments. We don't need amendments. We just create the, accept all the wording that comes in, because I think the whole thing's just positive. Yeah, that, that's fine. We'll let it finish. Yeah, I don't think there's anything left to say, is there? Really? I mean, just... No, I, I would just say that a local transport uh, infrastructure working group as such, um, which would encompass the, all of East Asia and look at all of our local infrastructure, I think that would probably cover rail, road, etc. The only thing is we have got a transport spokesperson. And that's Council Lennox. So yes. That's his job to do that, to do all this stuff. Member of Officer Working Group is another tier. Now we've got we've just been talking about placemaking and place localities. That could all be teased out and and because every ward's different. Barry spoke about uh, Hurlford. Unfortunately, the built houses where Hurlford Station was. So there would need to be a whole new station if we were looking at that side. So that could form part of the localities. I, I know you want a member of officer working group. Would it fit? I don't know. Uh, that's up to the council to decide. But I think my motion would be basically I accept everyone's amendments and everything, but I still would like, you know, to empower Councillor Lennox, a member of officer working group, 
because it's it's so important all aspects. We're hearing all these stories from everyone. I mean, I, I think I think it can't do any harm. And I think it can only do good. Well, that, there's a change to your to your motion then, um, because you wanted MSPs and MPs and other folk involved. Well, we, is there any any reason why they couldn't be involved? I mean, the more people we involve in this, the more power, the more power to our elbow. Right. right. Okay. Okay. Right. We'll get into a discussion. I was going to wait till hopefully the discussion came to a close, Provis, but there will be a few procedural issues. <clears throat> there does seem to be general agreement, but I think the mission is to be clear on what we're agreeing on here because there's no paper at the back of this, so we need to capture the, the, the detail. The proposal, whatever anyone thinks of the merits, the proposal you can see, members, is what's in front of you in the motion, which is a working group that would involve members of this council, and I think there's general acceptance there that they would come from the local wards uh, affected by the proposals, but there's a cumulative impact there we'll come back to. Uh, you've then got a suggested proposal as presented as the MPs for the affected wards, and again that will grow in number if the subject matter to be covered by this group uh, is to increase. And then you have the MSPs for the relevant constituencies as well, and then there's a suggestion of uh, members of councils in other regions. Um, in terms of uh, that then, you need to all be clear and agreeing. I'd understood that Councillor Lennox's amendment wasn't so much negating the suggestion of this outside group or this larger group. We normally, there's nothing in law, but member of some working groups are normally internal and purely populated by officers and members of the council. You can call it what you like, whether it's a member of a working group or a working group, but let's call this a working group. So the first proposal that council's been asked to agree today is, sorry, the second proposal you've been asked to agree is the composition. I think if, if Councillor Lennox is suggesting, yeah, we set up the group, but we build into the initial terms of reference that they adopt the locality planning arrangements that you've just signed off on and put in place, and why wouldn't you? Then that's more about the how they've been asked to go about it in a more process way, in a more substantial way than simply lobbying, perhaps, and stand outside places with placards at that level. And I'm not suggesting that's what's intended. So the bottom line is, is that if mem members first need to decide, and we need to know if there's a agreement before there's any vote on whether it's the composition as proposed in the motion. That would be local members from uh, the, the, the wards. So I'd just come back to the first recommendation. If there's also, as there seems to be general acceptance that Alton Hill and uh, Hurlford be included, then I think there seems to be a way forward, which would still be council approved and setting up the group, but with the enhanced approach in terms of reference as a starting point, as put forward by Councillor Lennox, as to how we expect that group to conduct themselves. Uh, noting that if there's outside membership, then it's not entirely going to be in the council's control. You then get to the composition. If the council's view is today, yep, you'll set up this working group with all the more members or the wards affected, then by my reckoning that's anything between 12 and 16 members because it's four different wards in terms of, maybe it's, is it three wards? I've not got my map in front of me, I was trying to check my bag there, but it's either three or four wards in terms of Mocklin and, uh, no, it's, it's four wards, one for obviously the Cumnock station, uh, one for the Mocklin station, one for Halford and one for Alton Hill. Now I've not got the map in front of me, but all our wards are a minimum of three members or some are four. So that's anywhere between 12 and 16 members on this outside working group just from the council. It would include Councillor Lennox because he's in one of the wards that would be affected as a transport spokesman. Uh, so the linkage between what they're going to do, who's going to be invited, needs to be dealt with in terms of uh, agreeing the composition. So what I'm trying to highlight is the impact of the high level amendments that have been accepted on what this is going to look like. And at the moment, it's looking like half the council before you start. Wait, wait, guys. Oh, right. We are where we are. Right. Uh, this is a really competent council. And it really is. I think, I think Dave has just put his finger on where, where we are here. It's a bit of a mess. I, I think we should be looking maybe to come back when we've got a bit more detail in front of us because it's evolved from quite a simple motion that, that John introduced in, in Wally's amendment. I think maybe we need to. To, to have something in front of us that we can all agree to that it's based on how this discussion today has went. I think I think you know if we take a wee bit of time to actually get that down in front of us so that we're all on the same starting point. I mean that would be really helpful because I think we've been asked now at the end of it's been a quite a long meeting to come up with some, you know, we're just cobbling it together and that's not really how we work as a council. 
It's it's uh, uh, my apologies. Our transport spokesperson is Councillor Ingram, and the uh, SPT is the one that Wally's on. So sorry about that, Wally. I was elevating you there. Um, Councillor McMahon, and then we'd need to really come to a close, guys. Now, can I say before we finish, um, you've got Ward 5 as well, because myself and Claire are looking at access and egress on at 77. So there's real transport issues affecting our ward. So I think it affects everybody. So if it came from that placemaking that uh, we agreed earlier, and that, that would mean all councillors, not just individuals going to a wee working group, and as Dave is quite rightly, how big do you make the working group? So if it came from placemaking, I think that would be the way ahead. Ian's come up with a very sensible uh, option. It gives us time over Christmas, New Year to come back with a proposal that would, and sorry to the officers, to go away and work out a, a, a plan for placemaking that would involve a real heavy impact for transportation in the wards. Councillor McMahon. Thanks, Provis. Uh, and I, I, I maybe didn't make it clear when I was uh, making my second at Councillor Lennox amendment. This is all about place for me. And the involvement, I, I, I mean, in the part of that placemaking paper that was earlier, earlier on there, it's about facilitating our local groups. I think we should be part of the lobby for our local groups, both not just us as elected members locally, but also the wider MSP and MPs. I think the leader's already said that he would write that letter. Uh, to the transport minister, also lobbying for it. So I think what we need to do is set up the individual place groups without officer involvement through that lobbying, come back to us. And as we're all aware that we did take part in that consultation for STPR2, right? So that consultation is in there on behalf of East Ayrshire Council. But this is but this is for me a run about place. Connacht's totally different from Auckland. It's totally different for Horford. And we all recognise that within the council. So for me, just to, for clarity on it, to back up that amendment, it's a bit place groups initially setting up the local uh, local groups and uh, councillors if required. Thanks for that. No, no, there's been a big discussion here. Councillor Lennox has been waiting for a while, and then I'm going to go to Kevin, and then we'll go to determination if we need to. There's been a, a great discussion in this. William. Uh, thanks, Provost. No, it was really uh, first. I first had my hand up just to clarify the rules. I was um, I was getting big heated there when you were referring to me as the spokesperson for transport. The other the other issue is just to just to reiterate that the amendment that I proposed um, is nothing to do with a working group. In fact, I, I prefer not to use a working group. Um, it's all all relative to placemaking and the placemaking initiative. So that the the communities uh, all get all have their say, um, and it's based on priorities within the community. So just to make that point, Robert, thank you. Well, oh, thanks for that. Appreciate it, Kevin. And then we'll go to determination, whatever way that goes. Thank you, thank you, Provost. Um, I've I've listened to this uh, debate with interest. Um, but I, I have to say there is there is documents out there that that cover a lot of these uh, uh, issues. In terms of STPR2, which was just published last week, the final document, um, I intended bringing a paper back to um, Cabinet in the new year, given the outcomes from, from the document. We have just completed the regional transportation consultation and submitted that back to SPT. And from that, we would hope that we would be able to develop a local transport strategy when that document... Kevin, folks, there's people talking, please. Well, we'll buy a ticket in the, the chambers, please. Kevin. When that document is published, we would then develop a local transport strategy from the regional one. Um, in terms of the A70 and the A71, these roads were, were both put into the STPR2 away at the start, and they were um, put out of scope immediately by um, the consultants that were working for Transport Scotland. They were deemed local roads, and it was there for the local authorities to to upgrade them. And I did put a proposal together for one of them to go through love. The A seventy six is National Trunk Road, and and that is covered in it in STPR two for minimal upgrades, whatever that is. Nobody really knows, and that's the same for the A seventy seven and the A seventy five. Um. Finally, I, I'd be happy to support uh, members across all these issues. 
you know, but we have to be mindful of the national documents and, and, and public documents that, that are there around uh, transport across the country. Thank you, Provost. Thanks. I think the, the support's here. Now, I'll go back, John. Proposal and seconded. Uh, we've had amendments. Where are we sitting? Well, I suppose we've got a duty to ask for a determination on the motion we put forward with accepting to be as as open as possible to anyone else who wants to join in with it, getting other stations. I mean, we've got between probably one and a half thousand to two thousand people at the end of the day that are expecting us to follow through and what we said we would do. So, I mean, we are looking as a start to have a working group set up of some type to pursue these two stations and other stations, which then could be expanded. Its remit can be changed to encompass anything. We're very open-minded, but we need... We've well, well, been there. Are you still, do you want to go to a vote to determination? Yes, I think we have to. We owe that to the people who've signed the petition and, you know, right. okay. public opinion. So. Now, that brings into a question uh, Councillor Lennox's uh, proposal, and I think the gist of that is that it's a member office or working groups not set up, but I think your gist is that it's placemaking that makes the transport decisions for the areas. We we are looking for some sort of member office or working group to focus on those two stations as a start, because we've got to start somewhere, even if it is only just the local members. Yes. I don't know if this is going to help, Chair, but we can try. The, the understanding was the amendment was on top of, but as Councillor Lennox and Councillor McMahon have clarified, the effect of the amendment is to move something different to the motion. The motion has set up that group with outside and in uh, council participation as set out in the motion. The amendment is effectively, as I understand it, I'm happy to be corrected, but the amendment is to basically deliver a broader integrated transport strategy building on the placemaking arrangements that have just been put in place by Council today. So those are alternative methods to addressing the same issue or wider range of issues. But the motion is set up a group to petition and lobby for the opening of two stations. That's the motion. The amendment is to broaden out the scope of that, but not to take it through that vehicle of a group, but to take it through existing council arrangements. And Councillor Lennon's quite clearly clarified he's not in his amendment supporting or suggesting it be featuring the build, the setting up of any kind of working group. So we don't have a consensus view on the substance of the motion, and therefore, hopefully having clarified it, uh, unless there is any acceptance that perhaps it would benefit from coming back in a report. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure what steer any officers or any of us could take away in terms of producing the report. So I think Council may need to go to the determination on whether to set up the working group as asked or whether to adopt the broader approach using the, exist the recently approved place making approach and arrangements that the council's just made part of its whole strategic direction going forward. I think that is the nub of the, the, the choices. And maybe what we could do is focus on the motion versus the amendment. And should the motion be carried, perhaps then on this occasion, take the composition of the working group. Because if the motion is carried, council's decision will have been to set up the working group. No, I'm happy with that. We're going to determination. So does everybody understand? The Councillor Ingram. Thanks very much, Chair. I was just wondering how, how much this is duplication of effort. If we're going through the, the kind of placemaking and uh, each area uh, has a chance to say what transport they need in that area, uh, how much this is maybe adding an extra uh, working group that doesn't actually need to take place. Well, that's that's fair, but I think we went, we went beyond that. That was the, the discussion that went around that, but I, I get your point. We're going to determination. Julie. Thanks very much, Provost. So again, I will just read the roll call and if you can indicate for the motion, which is Councillor McFadgen, said to be Councillor Neil Watts, mm. and for the amendment guided by Councillor Lennox. Can I just double check it yourself, Councillor McMahon, the second in that? Thank you. I understand there are a few members that have left the chamber, so if I do call your name, you're not here, obviously. Don't answer. <laughs> so I'll start with um, <laughs> Provost Jim Todd. Amendment. Councillor Stephen Canning. Amendment. 
Councillor Ellen Freel, amendment. Councillor John McFadden. Councillor John McGee. Councillor Elaine Cowan. Amendment. Councillor Maureen Mackay. Apologies, amendment. Thank you. Councillor David Richardson. Amendment. Councillor James Adams. Councillor Lillian Jones. Amendment. Councillor Ian Linton. Councillor Rita's left the chamber. Councillor Graham Barton. Amendment. Councillor Graham Boyd. Amendment. Councillor Barry Douglas. Amendment. Councillor Neil Ingram. Amendment. Councillor Peter Mabin. I think has left you. Councillor Claire Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Sally Cogley has left as well. Councillor Kevin McGregor. Amendment. Councillor Linda Holland. Amendment, please. Deputy Provost Claire Leach. Councillor William Lennox. Amendment, please. Councillor Alison Simmons. Motion. Councillor Billy Crawford. Amendment. Councillor June Kyle. Amendment. Councillor Jim McMahon. Amendment, please, Julian. Councillor Neil Watts. Motion. Councillor Drew Filson. Councillor Jennifer Hogg. And Councillor Elaine Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. The amendment is carried by 23 votes to five. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. Uh, members, thank you very much. It's been a long day, uh, a lot of business uh, conducted. I wish you all the very best for the festive period. Please stay safe. If you need to use whisky bar for medicinal purposes, there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, I hope everybody takes care of their neighbours and their families. And please help out if you can. Uh, I certainly am going to do. Uh, Wish you all the very best. Thank you. Merry Christmas, everyone.